All right, good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see you all. The, um, let me do some quick remarks at the top, and then we'll go to your questions. Um, today we have a rather interesting and illustrative uh, confluence of events. Uh, the Supreme Court, uh, as many of you have been covering, in a 6-3 decision, uh, turned away the last major legal challenge to the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and uh, just about an hour ago, the House, acting in bipartisan fashion, uh, sent trade adjustment assistance and AGOA to the President's desk. These are obviously two quite different policy issues, uh, but they illustrate some important things about this President and this Presidency. Uh, the first is, both of these uh, issues were aggressively pursued uh, by the President because of his laser-like focus on expanding economic opportunity for middle-class families. The President's core motivation for pursuing these policy priorities was to advance the interests of middle-class families. Uh, and that is why uh, he is so gratified uh, today uh, to see this progress. Uh, when it comes to the Affordable Care Act, there are more than uh, 6 million Americans uh, that uh, don't have to worry about their tax credits being taken away from them. Uh, these are uh, working families, middle class families, in some cases families that are working really hard to try to get into the middle class. Uh, and um, having access to health care is important for their families. It's also important to their uh, economic well-being. You know, obviously we've had an uh, ample opportunity to make the case about how important uh, trade uh, is to ensuring that American businesses and American workers have an opportunity to compete in a genuinely 21st century global uh, economy. Uh, the second important thing about these two uh, policy priorities is they illustrate the President's willingness to work with whomever will work with him. Uh, in the case of the Affordable Care Act, the President worked closely with Democrats in the face of blistering partisan obstruction from Republicans, partisan obstruction that continues to this day. Uh, but yet, the, because of the persistence of not just the President, but of Democrats on Capitol Hill, uh, we've made tremendously important progress for middle class families all across the country. Uh, this story on trade is obviously a little different. Uh, the President uh, had to work with uh, the, 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 the President's trade priority was actually opposed by a majority uh, of Democrats in Congress. But the President was able to work effectively with Republicans in Congress and uh, build uh, support among some Democrats in both houses to a, a build an effective bipartisan majority uh, to uh, accomplish this goal. The third is it demonstrates the President's willingness to take on tough challenges. Uh, and we've talked quite a bit about how, uh, and there was frankly a lot of second guessing about the wisdom of choosing to pursue something like health care reform so early in the presidency. This is something that presidents uh, in both parties over the last century had trialed and tried and failed to uh, complete. Uh, but the President uh, took this on because he was committed to um, uh, taking on the tough challenges uh, and trying to make progress uh, on even policy priorities that uh, Washington for a long time had just kick, kicked the can down the road on. Uh, the same is true of trade. There's a lot of skepticism about, uh, about the wisdom of the President trying to pursue this specific uh, policy priority. Uh, but the fact is uh, Democrats and Republicans were able to work together uh, to achieve this goal. Uh, and finally, and then we'll get to your questions, the fourth thing, and this is also, I think also important, uh, is we've talked a lot about the way that the President tries, about the President's leadership style. He focuses on a longer term objective and keeps his focus there. Uh, and uh, even in the midst of what he acknowledged uh, in the Rose Garden were some setbacks, that by being able to focus on the goal, uh, he was successful. Uh, there was a lot of talk about this actually during the President's uh, campaign in 2007 and 2008, uh, that this um, element of his personality and his leadership style served him very well in that campaign. I'm not sure that any of us who even saw that leadership style in the campaign understood how critical uh, that approach would be in running the White House. Uh, and ultimately, it has been really important that if the President had spent a lot of time reading the uh, obituaries that were written uh, about the trade legislation uh, or spent a lot of time worried uh, about the columns uh, related to uh, 
uh, the impending death of the Affordable Care Act, uh, that we probably wouldn't have made as much, uh, as much progress as we did. Um, but uh, so anyway, uh, the point is that uh, th this is an interesting day for a lot of reasons. Uh, but I do think it tells uh, even those of us who spend a lot of time working on these issues every single day, uh, I think there's a, a much broader story to tell uh, about this president, about his values, about his priorities. Um, and um, hopefully we'll have the opportunity to talk about that, among other things, in the briefing today. So with that long wind up, Nancy, why don't you uh, get us started? Um, can you tell us how the president learned about the ruling, some color about his initial reaction? And did you guys have any kind of a heads up that the ruling was coming today? Uh, we do not have a heads up. Uh, the Supreme Court obviously uh, is very wedded to their uh, process of informing the public uh, of their decisions. Uh, the President uh, was in the Oval Office uh, receiving his presidential daily briefing when uh, his chief of staff, Dennis McDonough, uh, the White House counsel, Neil Eggleston, uh, and the President, President's deputy chief of staff, Christy Canagallo, uh, came into the Oval Office to inform him of the uh, Supreme Court's decision. Uh, Ms. Kanagalo has obviously been instrumental uh, in, um, in ensuring the uh, effective implementation of the Affordable Care Act, uh, and she had uh, been um, uh, essentially running the process of sort of monitoring the outcome of the, uh, uh, the Supreme Court's deliberations. So uh, that's why she was involved in that discussion. So initial reaction, high-fiving? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wasn't among those uh, who were in the Oval Office, but obviously the President was very uh, very pleased to learn of, of, the, of the news. And has he spoken at all or commented at all, at all on the fact that it was John Roberts writing the decision once again that um, <coughs> saved the care of? Well, uh, uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, the, I think the President, though, uh, in the comments that he made at the news conference uh, in Germany a couple of weeks ago, uh, made pretty clear uh, that he thought this, this was a uh, a straightforward decision for the Supreme Court to make. Uh, and I, don't, I think that's why uh, many of us, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're not that surprised uh, that um, not just a majority of the Supreme Court, but in this case six of the nine justices, um, uh, issued a ruling that uh, we obviously believe is, uh, is the correct one. Okay. Roberta. Um, did, so after the President found out and um, there was, there's a picture of actually of uh, Dennis McDonough and, and him sort of like really happy. What happened? Like, did he call people? Did, did he reach out and tell people, yay, we've run? Or what? Uh, after he learned of uh, the news later this morning, the President did uh, place a telephone call to Don Verrilli, who's the Solicitor General of the United States, who um, presented the argument to the Supreme Court. Uh, I believe that the President uh, picked up the phone and congratulated uh, Mr. Verrilli on his successful argument in the housing discrimination case. Um, and uh, obviously that, that was a decision that we were pleased about today as well. Um, but that was, a, that was at least one phone call the President made today. And I mean, uh, you said that you didn't get a heads up um, because of the Supreme Court's procedures, but people obviously knew this today was a possibility, right? Sure. But, um, how did you all prepare for that? I mean, did you have speeches written, or how did you prepare <laughs> for that mentality? Well, the, uh, there certainly were uh, uh, a range of contingencies that we planned for, uh, and we certainly were mindful of the, of the fact that it was possible uh, that we could uh, face an adverse decision from the Supreme Court. Uh, but we were pleased, uh, relieved, and uh, not particularly surprised uh, with this outcome. And uh, after he gave his remarks in the Rose Garden, what did the President do after that? Was there some sort of celebration back there? Or? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, I think as the President ended his remarks, he said, let's get back to work, and I think that's what we all did. On, on Iran, um, last night a group of advisors who are close to the White House, um, like former advisors to the President on national security issues, uh, warned that a potential deal is at risk of failing to provide um, adequate, tough enough safeguards. How much pressure does this put on negotiators at this sort of cr critical juncture? Well, um, no additional pressure. I'll say. Uh, I do think that the uh, negotiators understand the stakes involved here. Uh, and the negotiators are certainly feeling uh, the pressure of the President uh, and our P5 plus one partners to reach an agreement that reflects uh, the principles that were agreed to in Lausanne uh, back in the first week of April. Uh, that is what we have said all along will be uh, 
the, will be necessary to complete these talks uh, and to complete a final agreement. I think that's one reason that um, uh, I think that's probably the most interesting thing about the letter uh, is the letter uh, essentially lays out the kind of criteria that is uh, broadly consistent with the framework that was announced uh, back in April. Uh, and the president was uh, crystal clear that the only kind of final agreement we would reach uh, is one that fulfills the principles that had previously been agreed to. So, so you see it as being consistent rather, raising, rather than raising a red flag about? Uh, yeah, I, and I think that's, uh, that reflects my uh, reading of the letter. Okay. Michelle? Some of the things the president said today, um, that the ACA is here to stay, uh, someday our grandchildren will look back on this. It really seemed as if he could feel his legacy kind of solidifying on this in front of him. And then to get trade finished on the same day. Um, does he talk about this, uh, how he views this in terms of his legacy at all? I mean, do you feel, do you get a sense that he's feeling that now? Uh, I get the sense, and I think this was uh, based on private conversations, but also based on what he said in the Rose Garden today, that he is keenly focused on and aware of the impact that this decision will have on the lives of millions of Americans. Uh, the President noted that, and I noted at the beginning, that there are, there are more than six million Americans that don't have to worry about their uh, tax credits being taken away. Uh, but there are millions more who got health care because of the Affordable Care Act. And there are tens of millions more Americans who didn't get their health insurance through the Affordable Care Act that benefit from uh, the provisions of the Affordable Care Act in a variety of ways. Women all across the country don't have to be worried uh, about being charged more because, simply because they're a woman. No one has to worry uh, about being kicked off their insurance because they get sick. No one has to worry uh, about hitting a lifetime cap uh, on their insurance. And those are millions of Americans across the country uh, who didn't get their health care through a uh, marketplace but do benefit uh, in very real and tangible ways from the provisions uh, that are the focus of the Affordable Care Act. So this being, as you put it, you know, such a big deal for his presidency and shaping his legacy, how does the president personally celebrate something like that? I mean, does he later crack open a beer or is he going to gather his colleagues together? What, what is his personal <laughs> celebration on that? Well, again, uh, uh, <laughs> possible. Uh, again, the, uh, I, I think the president's uh, enthusiasm about the announcement uh, is rooted in the impact that this is going to have on the American people, uh, rooted in the impact that it's going to have on middle class families across the country uh, and families who no longer have to worry about being one illness away from declaring bankruptcy. Does he, does and he celebrate this so I'm, time, uh, again, I, I don't know that the president uh, has specific plans to celebrate. Um, he obviously is going to spend some time tonight uh, writing an important speech that he's going to give tomorrow. Uh, but uh, the president is, uh, uh, is obviously gratif very gratified by the outcome. Uh, but he's gratified uh, because of the impact that this will have on uh, millions of Americans. This is why he ran for the job in the first place. We've heard such confident statements over the last couple of weeks, but the, the celebrations that we're hearing from other administration officials, too, and some of the things that they've been saying indicates that, you know, that maybe it, it wasn't such a, such a level of confidence um, in the decision being this one. W would you say that's the case, that, that there was some real worry there? Well, I think that there was um, a responsible um, contingency planning in place, uh, but, um, or at least thinking. But um, again, I, 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 you know, in talking to you all uh, earlier this week, I indicated that I wasn't aware of, uh, of anybody around here that was losing sleep over this. Uh, and I think that was a, a reflection of uh, the confidence that we had in the strength of, uh, of these legal arguments. And six of the justices, the justices of the Supreme Court agreed. Lastly, um, still, obviously, Republicans are vowing today to keep trying to repeal Obamacare. Um, you know, the real fight on trade could come in the actual deal with Asia itself. So uh, maybe not such a victory lap when, when there could be big battles ahead. Uh, I think that's exactly right. Margaret. Oh, thank you. Um, Ten years ago, Senator Barack Obama said he was going to vote no for John Roberts because it was his personal estimation that Roberts had far more often used his formidable skills on behalf of the strong in opposition to the weak, but he also said he hoped he was wrong. So what I'd like to know is, does President Obama think he was wrong? If he had to do it again, would he vote to confirm John Roberts? Or, or does he think this was just such a slam dunk that Roberts had no choice and he's really more strong than weak <laughs> so far? Well, that's a, uh, it's an interesting question. I think given the, given the President's uh, 
uh, unique relationship uh, to uh, Chief Justice Roberts, given the role that the two men have. Uh, I think I'm going to reserve comment uh, uh, on that. Uh, I mean, I, I think the President was, uh, uh, you know, quite blunt about his assessment of the merits uh, of this particular case. Uh, and uh, again, reading the uh, opinion that Justice, uh, the Chief Justice Roberts wrote, uh, it is. Uh, it seems like there are a lot of areas, at least in re with regard to this case, where the two men agree. Um, uh, so, can I try another one? Uh, tomorrow, um, in addition to whatever Supreme Court rulings may come out that could create another flurry of running around, uh, the president is going to go down to South Carolina. And can you talk to us a little bit about, uh, in addition to just being there to remember uh, the Reverend, what he'll use that speech to do? How much of a gun control push are we going to hear tomorrow? How will you handle? How will he handle the opportunity? Well, uh, there is, um, there, there's still quite a lot of work to be done uh, on the speech. So um, I, I'm not going to be able to provide you a lot of detail in advance about what the President plans to say. Um, the, as I mentioned yesterday, the, uh, the focus uh, of the speech uh, will be on celebrating uh, the life of Reverend Pinckney uh, and the eight others who uh, were killed in uh, the shooting last week. The memorial service is obviously for uh, Reverend Pinckney. Uh, there are other services that, were, that are being held for uh, the others who were killed. Uh, but the President will have an opportunity, uh, I understand, to uh, meet with many of the families of those who were lost last week. And um, I think the President will be mindful of um, not just how sad it is uh, that those individuals were taken from us, but also use the occasion to celebrate their lives. Uh, even in some of the news coverage that I've had the opportunity to read over the last week, uh, it's clear that we're talking about some rather remarkable people who led rather remarkable lives. Um, many of them uh, in the way that they went about their day-to-day -day lives, um, I do think serve as a genuine inspiration uh, uh, to others uh, about the way that they lived their lives and about the uh, values that they sought to embody in their day-to-day -day life. And I think that's uh, something that's not just worth uh, remembering, but something that's worth celebrating. Uh, and uh, you'll hear the President talk about this much more eloquently than I just did uh, tomorrow. In, Supreme Court, in reading uh, Ju uh, Justice Roberts, uh, the Chief's ruling uh, opinion on the opinion, uh, does this give the President any confidence or hints about how far he can expect to go either with his immigration policy, with any gun moves on gun control that are outside of legislation? Is he looking for clues in that ruling to see how far he can test the limits of executive power in the next year? Uh, I don't think so. And I, people who know a whole lot more about the Supreme Court than I do, uh, I think typically uh, will, uh, will warn against that. And I know that there are some who actually tried to read into uh, previous writings of Justice Scalia to try to interpret how he may rule in this case. And uh, that kind of speculation was uh, obviously wildly off base. So um, I, I think, you know, as we consider these important uh, legal questions that crop up periodically here at the White House, uh, the President and his lawyers have a tendency to focus squarely on the law. Okay. John. I'm sure you noticed that uh, Justice Scalia said that uh, the health care law could actually be called SCOTUS care. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I was reaction to that. Well, he, uh, uh, certainly is living up to his reputation for uh, an ability to turn a phrase, that's for sure. What, what, what does this say about Justice Roberts? There's been a lot of talk about the President's legacy and this solidifying or going a long way towards solidifying a big part of the President's domestic uh, legacy. What, what, what does it say about John Roberts' uh, legacy when it comes to this issue? Well, I would, uh, I would hesitate to, uh, uh, to opine on that topic for a couple of reasons. The first is uh, there are people who know a whole lot more about the law in the Supreme Court than I do. Uh, but the second is I'm also mindful of the, um, the business relationship, uh, if you will, that exists between the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and the President of the United States. So, you um, an assessment on Justice Roberts' you know, uh, tenure as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court? I'll, I'll let others weigh in on that, you know at least for now. say anything nice about the guy that's just now for the second time uh, <laughs> well, uh, come, I, come to the rescue? Well, I'm sure he would appreciate the kind words. I think the, the nicest thing that I could say about him was, uh, that he looked carefully at the law uh, and rendered a judgment that he believed was consistent with a reasonable reading of the law. Now, uh, and I certainly believe that that's what he did in this case. Now, in looking carefully at the law, one of the things he said is uh, the legislative process, closed-door legislative process, does not reflect the type of care and deliberation one might expect of such significant legislation. 
Uh, he clearly thought that this was a law that was pretty sloppily written. He's not alone in that assessment. Uh, what, 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 do you, what do you make of that now that you've you know, had to go through this whole process because of what you might call a snafu, but was clearly, a, at the very least, a significant drafting error? Well, um, I, I actually think that the, the, that the Supreme Court's decision today makes clear that that wasn't an error, uh, and that the reading of the law uh, and the reading of that phrase in the context of the, of the law is, is quite clear. Uh, and I think if it wasn't, uh, we would have seen a different outcome. So uh, there, there, may be, uh, there may be style points that are awarded in this case, but we're not particularly concerned about them. Okay. And, and one other just uh, unrelated, completely unrelated question. Uh, in, in the wake of the debate over the Confederate flag in South Carolina and now, of course, in other states in Mississippi, what, does the President have a view of, if you go up to Capitol Hill, you see all these statues of, of former Confederate leaders, you see other symbols associated with the Confederacy. Uh, does he have a view about whether such symbols are uh, divisive and, and have no place in, in a place like the United States Capitol? I haven't heard him express a, a particular view uh, on um, uh, on those on the statues, uh, and obviously that will be a decision for uh, members of Congress to make in terms of what kind of symbols they believe are most appropriate for uh, the building in which they do the people's business. Okay, Major. I named Michael McGarrity yesterday as the head of the fusion cell. Has the president met him before? Does he have any intention of meeting him in the near future? And can you tell us if either Mr. McGarrity or the State Department or Pentagon deputy assigned underneath him will either prepare documents or be a participant in the presidential daily brief on the status of hostages? Uh, Major, I don't know whether or not the President has had the opportunity to meet Mr. McGarrity. Uh, Mr. McGarrity was given uh, uh, this newly created role for now because of the role that he has been playing over the last several years uh, in the uh, federal government's effort to recover um, American hostages. So it was, this was a, a role that was easy for him to slide into. It's certainly possible that in the context of that work, uh, that Mr. McGarrity may have had the opportunity to meet the president. I just don't know the answer to that. Decided. So, was, did this go through up to the president's desk? Uh, this was a. Uh, uh, my understanding is that this is a decision that sort of came. At, this was a recommendation of the review group who conducted this particular review that he slide into, to this role. We'll, uh, let me confirm that for you. But I believe that that's correct. Um, uh, in terms of the presidential daily briefing, uh, I wouldn't necessarily expect that he would uh, be a regular participant there. Um, as you know that. There are a couple of things here that are relevant. The first is that there uh, will be a new position that's created at the Department uh, or at the Director of uh, National Intelligence. Um, the Office of the Director of the National Intelligence is a confusingly named agency. Um, but there will be somebody who works in his office who will be responsible for um, collecting all the intelligence related to American hostages. And so uh, it, it might be that that individual is more likely to communicate information about intelligence to policymakers that need to know, including the president. Uh, and then as it relates to, uh, you know, obviously the NSC will continue to play a leading role in convening this policy group uh, that will uh, also interface with the fusion cell. Uh, and so I would expect that a lot of the updates the president receives would also be from, uh, uh, from that uh, policy group uh, as well. So uh, I don't think that there would be a routine need for Mr. McGarrity to uh, communicate directly with the President in order for the President to be uh, fully informed to the degree that he would like to be uh, on these uh, priorities. Would you, would you say that there will be a higher priority placed on putting intelligence about American hostages held overseas into the PDB than was before, or is there no really change, no real change in that? Yeah, I don't know that there will. Uh, I don't know that there would be uh, a significant change in that regard, principally because the President's been pretty focused on this, and the President has already uh, been receiving uh, regular uh, updates on the ongoing efforts to try to uh, find and free American hostages. Um, I think it is certainly possible that the kind of information that the President receives uh, is, um, uh, frankly, is better information because of the effort to try to streamline the information gathering and analysis process at the director at the office of the director of national intelligence you have struck me as a kind of a nonchalant response to this uh, letter about the nuclear negotiations and many in the foreign policy community that are not opposed to a deal 
see it somewhat differently. They see it as a warning, like a, an enormous warning flag that these people who've worked close on this policy are fearful that the negotiations are going to yield something that falls far short of what their expectations were when they worked for the president and what they believed his expectations were when this process started. Why is that a incorrect interpretation? Because a lot of people I've talked to today read it exactly that way. Yeah. Not that this is reinforcing the administration's point of view, right. that it's like raising an enor a very loud alarm that it's off track. Yeah. Well, I, th I think the reason I would say that is, is simply that we've been very clear about what kind of criteria uh, or what will be essentially the outlines of the final agreement. And that was uh, what was announced in uh, the, uh, the political agreement uh, the first week in April. So I think that's why people can have confidence in the final resolution of the final agreement, uh, is that it will reflect those principles that we outlined. And if the talks don't get to a place where we can um, uh, essentially make sure we have a final agreement that reflects those principles, then there won't be a final agreement. The President won't sign on to something that falls short uh, of what was outlined in the political agreement back in April. Will he extend not only the negotiating period, but extend the framework uh, in an open-ended way because that is at least something that's agreed to and creates some room for future talks? I, this is another way of saying, forget, we've already sort of conceded and everyone assumes June 30th is not a hard and fast deadline, but we're not, I'm asking, could it go much longer than that? Because that's the only thing you've got going right now. Well, that's certainly not what we envision. Uh, at, at this point, um, you know, we have acknowledged that June 30th uh, is a deadline. It's still a deadline, deadline that we're operating against. Uh, it, I certainly would rule out the, uh, the possibility that, uh, much like uh, what happened earlier this spring, that this is a, these are negotiations that could spill over the deadline by a couple of days. Uh, but at this point, we're not planning any sort of uh, longer-term extension. Thing. Kathy Archuleta told Congress twice now, no one is personally responsible within the government for the hack. She said the perpetrators are the responsible parties. I understand that part. I'm not asking you to disagree with that. But for those who feel anxious and who are trying to find out and get on a call line where they wait four or five hours to get a non-response about what's actually happened to their data. Does the President, do you, spe you speaking on behalf of the White House, believe no one is responsible for what is a hack in the first place, systems that were vulnerable, and that systems that were identified to have been vulnerable for seven consecutive years by inspectors general analyzing the systems at the Department of, or, or, or at OPM? Well, Major, I can tell you that the, that the President certainly feels responsible when it comes to making sure that the sensitive data of uh, federal federal government personnel uh, is properly protected. Uh, and that is certainly not too much for those federal employees to ask. Uh, and that's the expectation that the President has set out for his team. Uh, and the President uh, is, is certainly willing to accept that uh, among his many other responsibilities. Now, what, so what's also true uh, is we're going to need some help from Congress, and we're going to need Congress to do their job. Uh, we put forward some very specific proposals that we would like Congress to pass when it comes to cybersecurity that would uh, improve the ability of both the federal government and the private sector to uh, respond to these incidents. Understood. But if you look at the testimony of the witnesses called, and they were not hostile witnesses, they were not against the administration, some were former inspectors general. Mm -hmm. They said these issues, these vulnerabilities, could have been addressed even without cybersecurity legislation coming from Congress. Those were things that are dealing with the government and private sector doing a lot more to share and integrate. But they said, and again, they weren't hostile witnesses, they said these things could have been buttoned up internally, and it's a management and leadership issue within well, OPM, not cybersecurity legislation that is the real culprit. Well, I think, I think uh, well, let me say a couple things about that. It, I think it's far too early to tell at this point uh, exactly what could have been, been done differently to ensure that we would be able to have prevented uh, this particular intrusion. This is, there's still an ongoing investigation. So it's too early to speak to that. Uh, at the same time, the President uh, and his team have acknowledged uh, that there's more that the federal government, quite frankly, is working very hard to do right now to bolster our cybersecurity and to bolster our cyber defenses. Uh, th this is, um, we're operating in a very dynamic environment uh, against adversaries that have proven to be very innovative. Uh, and this is a significant challenge, but this is not a challenge that's unique to the federal government. Uh, 
Uh, this is a challenge that private sector entities uh, are dealing with, and even some uh, media companies uh, have experienced uh, these kinds of intrusions in a way that have been damaging. So this is something that we all have, uh, uh, that, that, that across the public and private sector, uh, that we're all dealing with. Uh, again, I, I would reiterate, though, that some of the information sharing that we need Congress to act on uh, is information sharing that would benefit the federal government. If, we, uh, if, a, if a private sector company is the victim of a particularly unique cyber attack, we want to make sure that we can quickly communicate information about that attack, not just to other private sector actors, but also to uh, the government as well, so that we can make sure that we're not vulnerable to the same kind of uh, tactics that were used to penetrate someone else's system. So that's why uh, we've made that a real priority, and uh, Congress has really fallen down on the job here, and we want them to act. Since you said the President feels he's responsible, has he told his team to give him metrics by which he can know when the cyber defenses have reached a certain level, to remove vulnerabilities, and deal with these endless wait times that people have who are victims of this, trying to find out what they're supposed to find out when they call the number on the letter that they were sent to by OPM. Well, as uh, the, the president is serious about uh, about making sure that he's regularly updated on the efforts of agencies in the federal government to bolster their cyber defenses, and this is well. I um, I mentioned um, within the last couple of weeks here that uh, that this was actually an item on the agenda at a. A recent cabinet meeting that the president convened, where every member of his cabinet sat around the table, received a briefing about how important it is uh, to take seriously these concerns about cybersecurity. Uh, and there is a mechanism, uh, I believe the DHS has established me this mechanism, for tracking the progress that each agency is making in bolstering uh, their cyber defenses. Uh, and this is something that, uh, that they are tracking uh, uh, very closely. Some of this is also not just to um, you know, obviously making sure that they're following through on this commitment, but also making sure that they're getting the resources that they need to take the steps that are necessary to protect uh, their systems. How about wait times? Uh, the wait times is a, is a different issue. I, I don't know exactly how that's being tracked. Contractor and everything, but it's still a huge yeah. hassle. Yeah. Uh, there, there's no doubt about that, and I know that the contractor has undertaken um, some steps under some uh, pretty intense pressure from the federal government to try to streamline that process. Okay. Jordan. Yes. Hey, Josh. Now that Congress has passed both TPA and TAA, uh, when does the president plan to sign the bills, and is there a signing ceremony planned for that event? Uh, it's my understanding that the president has received the TPA legislation. Uh, because the TAA legislation only recently passed the House, I don't believe that's actually been delivered to the White House uh, at this point. Um, I don't have any details in terms of when the president will sign uh, these bills, other than to confirm for you that the president uh, is looking forward to the opportunity to sign them both. When he signs them, do you expect that lawmakers who were pivotal to the passage of the bills would be invited to the White House? Uh, I don't have any details on that yet, but as we, um, uh, as we start to make those plans, we'll let you know. Okay. Steve. Yeah, Josh. Um, the, it was a very complicated dance to revive TPA and TAA and get it all to the President's desk. Um, it wasn't uh, a, a simple process, and it ultimately it required trust between the President John Boehner, Mitch McConnell, and the few dozen Democrats who in Congress who were going to back it. Is there something that you take forward from that buildup of trust, them delivering on TAA after they'd already sent TPA, et cetera? Are there other things that the President can work with Boehner and McConnell in ways that maybe hadn't up until now? Well, uh, Steve, I think this, is, uh, this applies in a variety of uh, different contexts, but Straightening out a snafu uh, is not easily done. Uh, that's why you call it a snafu. That's why I called it a snafu. Uh, and so, uh, that, so the point is that, yeah, that was, that was difficult, and it was complicated, and it did require um, some procedural uh, 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 tactics uh, in order to get that uh, done. Uh, but you know, we obviously were pleased to see that that happened. The, I do think that it um, illustrates that it is possible for Democrats and Republicans uh, to work together on tough issues to make progress for the American people. Uh, and despite these uh, protestations from some Republicans that the President's uh, actions on, uh, on immigration reform were somehow poisoning the well, uh, that actually we can follow through on a principle that the President established, which is we're not going to paper over the significant differences that exist between Democrats and Republicans. They're significant, particularly on, uh, on economic issues. 
But the fact is we should set aside uh, politics uh, and focus on those areas where we do agree, even if there aren't, uh, even if it's not immediately obvious where we agree. And even if the uh, areas of overlap in agreement are small, there's still important things uh, that can get done. Uh, and that is, uh, that is a credit to the leadership uh, of Speaker Boehner and Leader McConnell uh, to recognize that opportunity uh, and to seize it. Uh, and I think what is really, I think the biggest takeaway uh, from this um, effort that has taken months now is that Democrats and Republicans, in order to get something important done, have to work together. At each stage of this debate, going all the way back to the uh, original uh, debate in the Senate, required Democrats and Republicans to build a majority. That, there were, that, that, that when there were critical votes, a party line vote was not going to be enough. The Democrats and Republicans were going to have to work together. Uh, and the president was pleased to have the opportunity to uh, participate uh, in this effort. Uh, and um, we'll have to see whether or not this serves as a template for confronting some other important challenges uh, and maybe even seizing some other important opportunities uh, that may be presented before the Congress. Well, the toughest one is the budget, obviously. Uh, we're headed for another shutdown showdown. There's no talks. Under, uh, is the president going to pick up the phone and call Boehner and take him up on his offer to negotiate something? Or is that something that, you know, we're, like, we can still wait a couple months on? That? Well, we certainly don't believe uh, that, uh, that Congress should procrastinate any longer uh, in confronting uh, this uh, budgetary responsibility that they have. Uh, what we have said is, um, is most likely to lead to success uh, is for Democrats and Republicans on Capitol Hill to follow the approach that was established by Senator Murray and uh, Chairman Paul Ryan. Uh, that ultimately, you know, two years ago, during the, in the context of the last budget agreement, uh, those two, uh, you know, a leading Democrat and a leading Republican, sat down at the negotiating table uh, and hammered out a budget agreement that didn't reflect anybody's idea of perfection. Uh, nobody got everything uh, that they wanted out of those talks. But what was generated and what was produced by those conversations uh, was a genuinely bipartisan piece of legislation that reflected uh, common ground between the two parties. Uh, and the president was pleased to, to advocate for that bipartisan compromise when it emerged. We would suggest that they follow a similar approach. Uh, the administration will certainly uh, be, uh, you know, be willing to support those conversations. Uh, and you know, we obviously are going to be uh, sitting on the side of, uh, of Democrats uh, in those discussions, um, which shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, but ultimately, it is Congress's responsibility to pass a budget. Uh, and Just like in trade, uh, the president has to, has to be the one to get his troops in line. The president needs to set the markers for what he'll accept and what he won't accept, what's on the table, what isn't on the table. Uh, and the Republicans are not, at this point, willing to negotiate with Patty Murray. Uh, they basically say talking to her now would be admitting defeat because they don't want to raise the caps. Uh, it seems like unless the president's going to personally get involved, pick up the phone, call Boehner McConnell, see what is you know potentially in the cards, we're going to be sitting here just like two years ago. You talk about Patty Murray and Paul Ryan. They only cut that deal after the government shut down, after there was already a crisis. Yeah. Well, I would say for anybody that uh, has uh, a question about where the president stands on this, they should consult the budget that we produced uh, almost five months ago now. We presented it in public for a reason, so that everybody could understand exactly where the president stands on this. Uh, so if there's any doubt about where the president draws the line, um, you know, I would encourage them to uh, consult the spreadsheets. Uh, but what I will say is that the president also is insisting uh, that, uh, that the Congress not try to pass a budget uh, along the lines of a sequester. Uh, that would undermine funding for critically important national security and economic priorities of the country. Uh, and so there's a template for uh, solving this problem. Uh, and again, it's a credit to Democrats and Republicans that they were able to uh, overcome their differences last time. But uh, we would merely suggest they not wait for a government shutdown this time. Let's follow the path that we know works. Uh, and the administration would, uh, and the president would certainly be uh, supportive of that approach. James. Josh, I want to ask you a few questions about the health care ruling and then move back to Iran. In any case, I promise not to take as long as some of my colleagues. 
whose initials rhyme with Major Garrett. <laughs> <laughs> that's rich, James. I swear to God, that's rich. <laughs> Let the record reflect the deity was just invoked. <laughs> um, Not you. <laughs> you were just pressed at some length in this briefing to tell us uh, whether the president celebrated this ruling. You wisely desisted from descriptions of bubbly flowing. Nonetheless, I wonder if you could tell us, does the president feel vindicated by this ruling? Uh, no, I don't think that's the way I would describe it. I, I think the president is pleased with this ruling because of the opportunity that it creates uh, for millions of Americans across the country. And that's, uh, that's really what he's uh, been focused on throughout the context of this entire debate. And it certainly was the first thing that popped into his head when he learned of the decision. In some public remarks that he made about uh, this case while it was being adjudicated by the Supreme Court, he averred to the possibility of the Supreme Court justices not, quote, playing it straight. Did the president believe that uh, only a decision in which the Supreme Court came down on his side would be evidence of the justices playing it straight? Well, James, I think the President was pretty clear in his remarks that he was encouraging uh, the justices to, uh, uh, to follow the, the precepts of the law. Uh, and that it, in the President's view, any fair reading of the law uh, would conclude uh, exactly the way uh, the, the, the Supreme Court concluded today. And you feel it was proper for the President of the United States to be using his bully pulpit to encourage the justices one way or another in their adjudication? I think the President was merely sharing his view uh, of the law. Uh, and I think the President, uh, at several points uh, in delivering that answer, made clear uh, that this is a decision for the justices of the Supreme Court uh, to make on their own. Uh, and the President certainly respects uh, and appreciates the independent role that the, uh, that the Supreme Court has in this matter. Lastly, on health care, you told us earlier in this briefing that the President received the news of the ruling uh, just as he was also receiving the Presidential Daily Brief. Um, does the President typically take the Presidential Daily Brief at or around 10 a.m. Eastern Time? It seems uh, rather late. Well, uh, it depends on his schedule for that day, but today that's when, uh, that's when it cropped up. Uh, and they typically, uh, they typically do it in the Oval Office, and I think it's actually often listed on the uh, the daily guidance that we issue every night. On Iran, it seemed to my eye to strain credulity for you to cast this open letter signed by 18 foreign policy heavyweights, five of them former top advisors to this administration, as some endorsement of the President's approach. This open letter states, and I quote, most of us would have preferred a stronger agreement. We fear that the current negotiations may fall short of meeting the administration's own standard of a good agreement. You say this is an embrace of the president's approach? Uh, I do. They, they, uh, they need not fear. Uh, the fact is we've been very clear about what kinds of principles we will apply uh, to ensure that we are shutting off every pathway that Iran has to obtaining a nuclear weapon uh, and instituting the most intrusive set of inspections that have ever been imposed on a country's nuclear program to verify their compliance with the agreement. Uh, they actually lay out four conditions uh, in the letter uh, that, that discuss uh, monitoring and verification. Uh, they say that, the, that uh, the final agreement should have, quote, timely and effective access to any sites in Iran they need to visit. We agree. The President has laid out the same principle. The second principle relates to possible military dimensions. Uh, they say that the IAEA inspectors must be able in a timely and effective manner to take samples to interview scientists and government officials. We've certainly indicated that that would be part of the kinds of inspections that would be imposed on Iran. The third principle they've identified relates to advanced centrifuges that the agreement must, quote, establish strict limits on advanced centrifuge R&D testing and deployment. We've laid out exactly what we believe uh, that should be, uh, and that is a priority, and that will have to be included in the final agreement. Uh, the uh, fourth thing was related to sanctions relief. They said that relief must be based on Iran's performance of its obligations. Uh, we've made clear that that will have to be part and partial of the agreement. Uh, and then the last thing, they talked about uh, the consequences for violations. They said that the, quote, the agreement must include a timely and effective mechanism to reimpose sanctions. We've talked uh, at length about the need to, uh, for the UN and for the administration to be able to snap sanctions back into place uh, if we determine that Iran is in uh, violation of the agreement. So in terms of the principles that they've laid out, they are generally consistent with the pr principles that we've previously identified. That's why people need not be concerned. Uh, that the President will sign on to an agreement that falls short of the principles that he has outlined back in April. So these 18 experts on foreign policy, including the former CIA director, David Petraeus, mm -hmm. the uh, former Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Cartwright, 
uh, five former top aides to this administration, they all just fail to perceive how close to uh, what you're doing is their set of guidelines. They all just got it wrong. No, I, I don't think that at all. I think what they're doing is they're laying out what they think is most important uh, in terms of what an agreement should look like. And given the fact that they used to work for the administration, I'm not, I don't think it should be a surprise to anybody that the, what they've identified as the most important uh, uh, principles for evaluating an, an agreement are quite similar to the principles that the President himself has identified. They're telling you most of us would have preferred a stronger agreement. How is that, a, how is that consistent with what the President's doing? Well, it's consistent with what the president's doing is because the president has, uh, because they themselves have identified five principles that they think are important to including in a final deal, uh, and those principles are generally consistent with the principles that we have previously identified too. So it's much ado about nothing. Well, I, I don't know if Shakespeare needs to be invoked, but uh, um, but I, I I I think that what this letter illustrates is it illustrates that they have worked uh, on this issue, that many of them have looked at this very closely. Uh, and they have arrived at a conclusion uh, that's broadly consistent with uh, the kinds of uh, principles that the President himself has established. And so when they say, we fear that the current negotiations may fall short of meeting the administration's own standard of a good agreement, they just don't understand what the administration's doing, I guess. I just tell them that, that they have uh, no reason to fear uh, that the uh, kind of agreement that the President uh, indicated uh, in early April that he would seek to complete by the end of June uh, is consistent with the principles that we've put out, uh, and that is uh, broadly consistent with the principles that they've outlined in their letter. Do you know of any precedent for this kind of open revolt by a set of former aides to the president uh, while he's still the sitting president? Well, again, I, James, I, I certainly wouldn't uh, use that word to describe it. I, I think that this is a, this is a thoughtful letter, uh, and it certainly is worthy of uh, thoughtful consideration. Uh, and um, again, I, I, it reflects the kinds of priorities that the President has already identified. Okay. Zeke? Thanks, Josh. Um, the President said earlier today that the health care law has been settled over and over again, that it's now woven into the fabric of America. Yet a new poll released early this morning finds that 50 percent of Americans believe that this law should be overhauled or repealed entirely. Uh, so obviously it's not settled, at least with the American public, you're still seeing a dozen or so Republican presidential candidates saying this law should be repealed entirely. Is this a communications failure on the part of the White House? Why has the President not been able to sell his signature legislative achievement to the American people who now have been benefiting from it or, or not for two years? Uh, Zeke, I think what I would do is I would refer you to the President's remarks where he noted uh, that many people were benefiting significantly from the provisions of the Affordable Care Act, uh, not understanding that they were benefiting from the provisions of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and I recognize in a political context that would be a significant problem, but in a health care context uh, it doesn't make a lick of difference when you're trying to reduce health care costs and save people's lives. But so now it's been two years though where the White House talks about health care, you know, at least once a week, all, you know, at time at, for stretches is every single day, social media, funny or die, all these different ways of talking to people and still, you know, how to sign up for, for coverage, all the different co coverage ways their health care was affected by this, and still they, they, their, the public opinion hasn't really moved much. What's the problem, you know, are, are people liking something and then deciding they don't, are people benefiting, benefiting from it and deciding even though I'm benefiting from it, I still don't like it? That seems to be where most people are right now. Uh, uh, Zeke, I, th I think you're very focused on public opinion and you certainly are entitled to, uh, uh, to make that observation. Uh, we're focused on health care outcomes. We're focused on the historically slow growth in health care costs. We're focused on the millions of Americans who've got health care for the first time because of the Affordable Care Act. We're focused on the tens of millions of Americans that no longer have to be worried uh, about uh, losing their health insurance just because they get sick or having to declare bankruptcy just because someone in their family got sick. We're focused on the small business owners that for the first time uh, are in a position to offer affordable health care to their workers without having at risk or, or undermine the central uh, success of their business. Those are the results that we're focused on. And there will continue to be an active political discussion of the Affordable Care Act. That is the, uh, that is the essence of the American political system. Uh, but in this case, uh, you know, there are plenty of people who are focused on politics. Uh, the President's focused on the results of his health care reform law that's making a difference in the lives of millions of Americans. I just want to follow up on John's question from earlier. Um, he asked you about congressional sta uh, statutes in Congress. Uh, a number of uh, American military bases which do fall under the purview of the executive branch are named after Confederate officers. Is that something <coughs> that the President has directed DOD to review, or is that something that the President is satisfied with that I think nine or ten bases are named after Confederate colonels or generals? 
Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, active discussion of, of the names of any U.S. military installations, uh, but you can check with the Department of Defense on that. that the president, you know, would like to open up at some future point, or you have, there's been no discussion. Uh, I'm not aware that that's uh, uh, that that's something that the president considered. But if that changes, we'll let you know. Okay, Byron. Thanks, Josh. Um, Director of National Intelligence James Clapper said today that China is the lead suspect in the Opium Act. Uh, if that's ultimately confirmed as true, what kind of response can we expect from the United States? Uh, Byron, at this point, uh, I'm not in a position to talk about uh, any potential suspects uh, in the ongoing investigation. Uh, I'd refer you to uh, either DNI Clapper or to the FBI, who's leading the investigation for uh, the latest assessment. Uh, if they decide uh, that it is actually in the interest of the, of the investigation to uh, be clearer about who they suspect may be involved, uh, that'll be a decision for them to make. Suspects? Uh, Sorry. Uh, the, the other thing I will just point out is that the um, I, was, I, I wouldn't guess at this point about what sort of response uh, the United States uh, may consider uh, at this point against uh, whoever is responsible for this particular incident. Uh, what is uh, true is that if there is a response, it's probably not one we are likely to telegraph in advance. Uh, and two, uh, you recall that earlier this year the President actually signed an executive order uh, authorizing the Secretary of the Treasury uh, to levy sanctions financial sanctions against individuals who carry out cyber attacks or who benefit from them. Uh, that gives the U.S. government uh, a whole set of new tools that didn't previously exist uh, for responding to incidents like this. So uh, I'm not telling you that those tools will be deployed uh, in, in response to this incident, but they certainly are available. Uh, changing topics, what kind of outreach is the White House doing with Congress as the Iran uh, talks deadline is enters the home stretch? Well, there are uh, members of Congress in both parties who serve on relevant committees uh, who uh, are part of uh, frequent briefings uh, by senior members of the President's national security team. Um, you know, obviously, there are mem members of Congress who are very interested in uh, understanding the uh, current state of negotiations. Uh, and so um, I don't know that there's any sort of regular meeting schedule that's been established, but I know it is not at all uncommon uh, for members of Congress who are interested in this issue to get a phone call from uh, somebody at the State Department or some intelligence community or even somebody at the White House uh, to give them an update on where things stand. Okay. Alex. Hi. Thanks. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Uh, this trade deal, you've hailed it as a bipartisan accomplishment. You praise the leadership of Mitch McConnell and John Boehner. Mm -hmm. Was it easier for the White House to work with Republican leaders than it would have been were Democrats in control of uh, both the House and Senate? Well, that's a difficult thing to, uh, uh, I guess, sort of the uh, um, the counterfactual, if you will, if the elections had turned out differently. Uh, I think what is clear uh, is that regardless of who was in charge of the United States Congress, it would require a bipartisan effort to get this across the finish line. Um, so in this case, the President was dealt a hand where he had to deal with Republican majorities in Congress who, you know, were saying the President had poisoned the well and uh, indicating that they were not really willing to work with him on any sort of bipartisan priority. Um, and we certainly were pleased uh, that uh, Republicans did not follow through on that threat, uh, and they actually uh, set aside their, uh, their partisan differences to try to find uh, some area of agreement. Uh, and uh, in this case, I think that's going to yield uh, important benefits for the American public and for the American economy for years to come. On the Confederate flag issue, the President has said it belongs in the museum. Yesterday, uh, former Senator Jim Webb, who was considering running for President, called for respecting the flag. Does the President think in general that anyone running for the Democratic presidential nomination should think that the flag should not be flown on state grounds, should, should not be endorsed in any way by the state? Well, uh, I'm not aware that, uh, that, that, that Senator Webb has uh, decided to throw his hat in the ring. Um, I did have uh, the opportunity to read uh, some of the news coverage of his, uh, apparently what is a Facebook posting. Um, you know, obviously uh, he and the President don't agree on this issue. Okay. Chris. Josh, a question on the transgender woman who interrupted the president on immigration policy during the Pride reception yesterday. In an op-ed with the Washington Blade, she writes, it is heartbreaking to see how raising these issues were received by the president and those in attendance. If the incident were to happen again, would the president respond in the same way? Well, I, I think uh, the president was pretty clear yesterday that, um, uh, that we uh, hope it doesn't happen again. And if it were to happen again, would the president respond in the same way? No, I, I, I certainly hope it doesn't. Tamara. Well, I want to follow up on that. Uh, okay. One of the issues the protester tended to highlight was the treatment of transgender people in immigration detention facilities. Transgender immigrants make up 
one out of every 500 people in detention, but account for one out of five people confirmed, by, uh, confirmed in sexual abuse cases in ICE custody. Sometimes these individuals are placed in solitary confinement for safety, but that causes its own problems. Is the president aware of this issue, and will he take administrative action to end it? Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that he is aware of the issue, but I'd refer you to the Department of Homeland Security, and they may be able to give you some more information on it. In other news, a six-person jury in New Jersey, while you're at the podium, rendered a verdict declaring a practitioner of widely discarded ex-gay conversion therapy committed fraud by promising it could change, change sexual orientation. The president has spoken out in favor of banning this practice before. What's your reaction to that? Uh, well, it obviously, uh, it, it sounds like the jury reached a, a conclusion that's uh, consistent with the president's views on this topic. Tamara. Yeah, this is sort of a very light question on a more serious day. It's okay. <laughs> Here goes. Light but, questions are good, too. Um, you have known the president for a very long time. He seems to be letting loose a little bit more, at least from where we sit, I think. Okay. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. I mean, even the, the heckling event last night, he, you know, no, 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 not in my house. I mean, he just, it seems like maybe he's a you know, a little lighter as his presidency has gone on. And I'm, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Well, the president certainly uh, is still dealing with some pretty weighty issues. Uh, and um, I think it is, um, I think it is fair to say that the president loves his job. Uh, and he is genuinely pleased about the opportunity that he has uh, to do it. And I think some of the enthusiasm that you see from the president, uh, even in public, uh, is consistent with the kinds of enthusiasm, the kind of enthusiasm that we see from the president, uh, even in private, and he is genuinely, de genuinely determined uh, to try to make the most of every day that he has remaining here at the White House. And so, uh, a lot can get done uh, in 18 months, uh, and the president is determined to use uh, every single day to um, uh, to try to advance many of the priorities that uh, he believes uh, we need to make additional progress on. Is he? Um, I'm thinking of the Mark Marin interview. Um, <laughs> Is he more willing to just say what he thinks these days? Well, are you suggesting that maybe the president has a bucket list uh, of some kind? Uh, that is another example. <laughs> that is another example. Stella got her roof back, <laughs> et cetera. Look, I, I, um, again, I, I, I think a lot of this is open to interpretation uh, depending on uh, your perspective. Uh, and uh, the perspective that I have is somebody who is genuinely enthusiastic about the opportunity that he's been given uh, to serve the American people, to try to ad ad advance an agenda that he passionately believes in uh, and that is consistent with, frankly, uh, the kinds of things he's been passionate about throughout his career even before he entered public life. Uh, this is somebody who, once he graduated from law school and had lots of lucrative, luc lucrative offers on the table, uh, you know, packed up his car and drove to Chicago so he could work in a, uh, in a poor neighborhood trying to meet the interests of, uh, advance the interests of working people on the south side of Chicago. Uh, and you don't do that uh, if you don't have a lot of passion uh, for trying to uh, champion uh, the, uh, the interests of middle class families. And uh, I think at the time the president was packing up that car, I don't think he could ever have imagined uh, that he would have the opportunity that he has now to use so much power and influence uh, to try to advance the interests of middle class families. So I think there is a measure of that that he finds very satisfying. Uh, and I know that he finds it uh, very motivating. Uh, and um, you know, I, I think it does, does give you some insight into uh, yeah, the, the enthusiasm that is occasionally on display. Do you think we're going to see more bucket list type, both policy and verbiage use? Uh, <laughs> yes, I think you will. I think you will. Alexis. Josh, two quick questions on health care. The President talked about uh, his continued desire to see states expand Medicaid and his desire looking forward to work with governors or state legislatures. Because the case itself and the and the what it turned on didn't deal specifically with that part of the law, can you describe how the president thinks that the ruling today might encourage state legislatures or governors to look ahead and think differently about expanding Medicaid? Well, Alexis, we've been pretty blunt about our assessment that many of the states, I think every state at this point, that is blocking Medicaid expansion uh, is doing so for pretty blatant political reasons. Uh, and if, it, I think it still remains unclear if this uh, will be an impact, a consequence of the ruling. But I think there certainly is the potential that at least some of the 
political freight that has been attached to the Affordable Care Act might at least have been jostled loose. Uh, and if there's a little less politics uh, infused in this debate, uh, then maybe that will persuade uh, at least some states to decide that they're going to set those politics aside and actually focus on what's in the best interests of the citizens of their state. Uh, because if you just evaluate the question that way, it's not even close. This, it, that it should be a, uh, a turnkey kind of decision when you have the federal government paying for more than 90 percent of the cost uh, of ensuring that uninsured citizens in your state who make more than the poverty line, uh, but yet not enough to qualify for uh, health care subsidies. It's clearly in their interest. A lot of states that have done this have actually found that it has a financial benefit for the state. Um, and so, you know, each state crunches the numbers differently. Each state has had a different experience. Uh, and, but what is beyond question uh, is the positive uh, impact that expanding Medicaid has had on the health of millions of Americans. And then just to follow on, if, if the effect of this might be to, to jostle some of the political freight loose, looking ahead at Congress, does the President, does he believe that this decision will not in any way change the disposition of Congress to look again at some elements of the Affordable Care Act in which there's bipartisan support to, to, to make constructive changes? I'm thinking of the medical device situation. Does the President believe that's going to wait for a new Congress and a new President, or does he think that there's potential after this decision to work together on fixes? Well, again, I, uh, Alexis, I think principally because of all of the, the politics that's been infused in this debate from the beginning, we haven't seen, at least to my mind, uh, a genuine, bipartisan, constructive effort to strengthen health care reform in this country. Uh, could this, could one consequence of this decision be uh, that members of Congress, principally Republicans, take a, a different approach here? Uh, that's possible. Uh, and the President has always indicated an openness to entreaties from people on both sides of the aisle who have a genuine interest in strengthening the law. Uh, we, will, uh, we will accept those kinds of offers in the spirit in which they're received and see if we can find common ground and advance them. Uh, but we haven't seen those kinds of proposals materialize over the last uh, five years. Uh, but if they do now, uh, we're happy to have that discussion. Okay? Francesca. Uh, back on the bucket list thing, uh, you kind of talked <laughs> no, but on a serious note, you, you've kind of talked about this a little bit uh, today. But what else is on the President's bucket list? Again, on a serious note, you, you know, these are you know, huge sigh of relief, as you, as you noted. At the top of the briefing, you know, trades uh, practically done, at least from a congressional standpoint, you know, health care. So, so what else in the next 18 months are you guys looking forward to accomplishing? Well, I, I, um, I think I would differentiate between the President's uh, legislative policy priorities uh, and the President's bucket list. Uh, I think those are, uh, those are usually two different things. bucket list of things so. you'd like to accomplish yeah. before you guys leave the White House. I mean. I, I'm referencing something slightly different when, uh, when, I, when I reference the, the bucket list. But, uh, priority list. Let's call it the priority so, list. There you go. A wish list. Uh, I, I, there are a couple of things that, that, that come to mind. Uh, there obviously uh, will be a continued effort to uh, ensure that we're maximizing the positive impact of the Affordable Care Act by effectively implementing that law. Uh, and so whether it's getting additional states to expand Medicaid uh, or, uh, you know, getting uh, more Americans to sign up during the next open enrollment period, uh, we're, we're going to continue to be very focused uh, on that. Uh, when it comes to working with Congress, we certainly do have an interest in trying to facilitate some bipartisan compromise on Capitol Hill and avoid a government shutdown, uh, avoiding uh, the risk of, um, uh, 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 of the full faith and credit of the United States. Uh, we should be able to um, uh, ensure that those kinds of decisions are made without drama and without a way that has a negative impact uh, on our economy. Uh, it's going to require some compromise. It's going to require some bipartisanship. Nobody's going to get everything that they want, uh, but we should be able to find some common ground uh, there. Uh, there's been a lot of talk uh, over the last six months about the possibility of working across party lines to uh, implement some important reforms to the criminal justice system. Uh, the President has hosted conversations with Democrats and Republican uh, members of Congress uh, here at the White House. Uh, I would anticipate that future discussions like that will occur. Uh, and I think that certainly is a ripe opportunity for us uh, to work in bipartisan fashion and do something that would be really good for the country. Uh, you know, there's been some discussions about whether or not uh, we could close some, le uh, some tax loopholes uh, and use revenue from those uh, uh, 
those closed loopholes to invest in infrastructure. Uh, there's some indication that Republicans, at least in principle, some Republicans in principle would support uh, an idea like that. We certainly would welcome uh, conversations along those lines. So uh, those, are, those are just a few ideas off the top of my head, but I think that's a, a pretty good illustration of what I was trying to uh, convey to Tamara, which is that uh, that's a lot of work to do uh, in the next 18 months. Uh, and the list is even longer than that. Uh, and that's why the President, uh, again, I think is hoping to make the most of every single day that he's got left in the office. All right. Fred. Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, you just mentioned uh, criminal justice reform. That's one of the questions I was. Uh, I thought about asking. There is a field hearing actually uh, with the House Judiciary Committee, um, and uh, on criminal justice reform, uh, they sure. plan to have a few of these. Um, and Chairman Goodlett and Ranking Member Conyers are in agreement uh, on on this. They want to do a sort of piecemeal, have a sentencing reform, uh, over criminalization in certain bills. Um, it's uh, quite present in the Senate. It looks like uh, Chairman Grassley is a little bit skeptical of this. Uh, um, is, is, would, would the White House support doing it more piecemeal, which is being looked at in the House? And how do you uh, see getting over that um, hump in the Senate with Chairman Grassley? Is sort of well, uh, Fred, I think it's fair to say that we're in the very early stages of this effort. Uh, and, you know, we've had. Uh, Senior members of the administration, including the President, have had a wide variety of conversations with uh, Democrats and Republicans in both the House and the Senate on this. And uh, there, uh, I, there are some ideas that we've started to hone in on uh, that do enjoy some bipartisan uh, agreement. Uh, but there will be some other basic tactical questions that are related to what the legislation actually looks like and how it would move uh, through the Congress. Uh, those are decisions that still uh, need to be made. Uh, but, you know, right now we're having a discussion that's focused on the policy level, and uh, we've been encouraged by the early kinds of, the kinds of early discussions that have taken place already. And, uh, secondly, uh, today there was a uh, hearing with the House Oversight Committee regarding uh, 24,000 emails that were lost with the, uh, when, uh, 500, 400, uh, more than 400 uh, backup drives were erased uh, with concerning the lowest learner emails. Um, Chairman Chaffetz said that this is uh, could be a, a case of evidence actually being destroyed. Um, does the White House have any reaction or any thoughts about that? Well, uh, I don't, I'm not sure that that's um, exactly what occurred. Better refer you to the Treasury Department for a more fulsome answer. All right, um, Andrew. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, right, I need one last one. Oh, okay. Okay. I, if I could just uh, ask, based on that, uh, based on that, the. the the Congress is getting fewer documents. Does the President still stand by his belief that there wasn't a smidgen of evidence or a smidgen of corruption involved in the Absolutely. Irish Absolutely. Okay. And um, the Palestinian Authority earlier today sent evidence to the, or alleged evidence to the International Criminal Court in an effort to uh, have in Israel investigated for alleged war crimes. So I'm wondering, does the administration oppose the Palestinian move? Uh, can you say the first part of your question again? Uh, the Palestinian Authority sent evidence, what they call evidence, to the International Criminal Court concerning alleged Israeli war crimes. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not aware of that particular development, but we'll, uh, we'll get you an on-the-record response to that question. So, yes, I'll make sure that we get it around. Um, and a second question, sure. Paul's question. Um, earlier today also, around 200 Burundian uh, students entered the embassy in Bujumbura, and they were asked rather forcefully to leave and convinced to leave. I was wondering, was there any assessment as to whether they might undergo any persecution before that decision was taken to have them leave? Yeah, I, I've, I'm aware of this, uh, of this incident occurring, um, but I'd refer you to the State Department for the actions that uh, were taken by the embassy in this, in this matter. Okay. John, I'll give you the last one. Thanks. Um, the Affordable Care Act uh, affects millions, if not tens of millions, of Americans. You've talked about that, and the President has as well on countless occasions. Would you agree that the hostage policy changes announced by the President yesterday only affect about 30 or so families in this country? Well, I guess I'm not entirely sure what you're asking. Just, my, my question, I thought, was pretty straightforward. Who's impacted immediately by the changes of the President's announced hostage policy review? Is it just 30 families across this country? 
Well, uh, John, I guess the, uh, when Lisa Monaco, the President's top counterterrorism advisor, was here yesterday, she was asked specifically uh, how many uh, Americans are being held hostage overseas, and her answer was uh, more than 30. Um, but um, I think the impact of the uh, hostage review group's recommendations uh, is principally related to restructuring and reforming um, the government process for responding to these incidents and making sure that we are effectively coordinating and leveraging all of the resources of the federal government to uh, confront these very uh, difficult situations. And a part of that effort uh, involves streamlining uh, communication with uh, the families that are uh, going through a terrible ordeal. Um, but, you know, I, uh, I, I don't know if you're seeking to confirm a specific number or... No, no, I'm not. I, I okay. mean, I, I think that Lisa Monaco was uh, quite vague about it, probably intentionally, as to how many Americans are, are being held hostage at this very moment. I thought most people thought it was pretty uh, revealing for her to say that it was more than 30. Uh, I mean, it could be any number over 30, right? I suppose that's true. So, I, mathematically I, speaking. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and that makes it big, right? Um, uh, if, uh, I, guess that's, I guess that's your point. You're certainly entitled to it. No, no. I wasn't making that okay. being my point. My point was simply, whatever that number is, the policy changes announced by the President yesterday only right now at this moment affect those families impacted by a loved one being held hostage. Uh, yeah, I guess that's right, but it certainly has a significant impact on the day-to-day -day, um, efforts uh, of members of the military, uh, our diplomats, members of the intelligence community, uh, law enforcement, who do spend a lot of time uh, trying to uh, rescue uh, Americans who are being held hostage overseas. So uh, they all are um, directly affected by the, um, the announcement from yesterday. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody.